the White the House and Ari Fleischer. Today, and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, the president this morning uh, began his day with a breakfast with the congressional leaders. It was with the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader of the Senate, Minority Leader of the House, Minority Leader of the Senate, the Majority Leader of the House. Uh, with the President talked to them about the latest developments in the war and continued the part of the bipartisan consultations that he committed to. Uh, he had an intelligence briefing followed by FBI briefing, convened a meeting of the National Security Council and met with the Secretary of Defense. He had a meeting with the President of the Slovak Republic where he discussed the importance of the strong ties the United States has to Slovakia. He thanked the President of the Slovak Republic for their strong support in the war on terror and in the operation uh, to disarm the Iraqi regime. And let me also address a question I was getting from many people earlier this morning about whether the President watched the events on TV that the nation has watched. Uh, at 10.45 this morning, the President watched live television coverage of the attempts in Baghdad to topple the, the statue of Saddam Hussein. At the time, he was also briefed on what transpired earlier on TV, where the Iraqis climbing on top of the statue, the arrival of the U.S. vehicle, and prior to that, the Iraqis celebrating in the streets. He watched this briefly from the outer office of the Oval. Uh, he had previously been in a meeting of the National Security Council in the Situation Room, and also in a meeting in the Oval Office with the Secretary of Defense, so he had not yet had an opportunity to see this. After his meeting with the President of Slovakia, at approximately 11.20, the President returned to the area right outside the Oval Office where the statue had already come down and he watched it dragged through the streets of Baghdad. He walked out, saw it on the ground and exclaimed, they got it down. Um, he watched with interest for a few moments and his reaction, I think it's fair to say, is one of both caution, a uh, measure of caution, but also an expression of the power of freedom that we are seeing in the streets of Baghdad for the Iraqi people who yearn to be free. One announcement for you. The President will meet with President Ngo of the Republic of Korea on May 14th. The President looks forward to welcoming President Ngo to the White House to reaffirm the enduring strength of our 50-year alliance with the Republic of Korea and to discuss how our two nations can cooperate as full partners to bring about a peaceful resolution of the North Korea nuclear issue, the reinforcement and development of the United States-Korean alliance, and the promotion of bilateral economic ties. With that, I'm happy to take your question. Ron? A lot of people are going to watch these events and assume that the war is over. Can the war is not over. Can you tell us what one, two, three, four, five, six things that need to happen before the president can address the country and say the war is over? Well, first of all, it's much too premature to even speculate about that. From the president's no, point of view... You've already said it's not over. I'm asking you, what is it that would have to happen for him to be able to declare the war is over? Well, the president urges all Americans to remember, and there, there, there are two Two reactions the president had to this morning's wonderful news and the signs of Iraqis in the streets celebrating freedom and toppling the statue of Saddam Hussein. But the president's reaction is twofold, and you cannot separate one from the other. The first is a, a message to the American people that we still need to be cautious because we still have our armed forces in harm's way. There still is fighting ahead of us, that there are main cities, particularly in northern Iraq that are not in the same position as cities in southern Iraq or, or portions of Baghdad. And so therefore the president remains very cautious to protect the lives of the men and women and armed forces who remain in the middle of a military mission where fighting can still break out at any moment and where not everyone has surrendered. The president's second message is something that he has talked to the American people about repeatedly, and that is that the long-suffering Iraqi people yearn to be free, and that this is an operation of liberation. And until the military situation is, is brought to an end, and it is not, it still is underway, and until uh, the other aspects that the president laid out involving um, liberation have taken place, I would make no predictions about what the president might say or when. I'm not asking you what time. I'm not asking you when, and I'm not saying that the war is over, I'm not looking for a reaction to his events today. You already said that very particularly. What I want to know is what specifically, what are the goals that have to be accomplished before he will declare that the war is over? You know, I think this goes back to what I said at the very beginning, Ron. The president has said that this is a military mission. The military remains in harm's way and until the military mission is accomplished. I don't think the president is going to be at that point in his own mind. What is the military mission that has to be accomplished? There still is fighting that could lay ahead. The Vice President said today in his speech that 
There would be a meeting on Saturday of the uh, Iraqi exiles in Nazaria, a town in southern Iraq. Has this signaled uh, the beginning of the interim government? Uh, no, it does not. It, it does not. And I think the vice president has subsequently uh, updated his statement to indicate that it will be sometime after Saturday, not on Saturday. Um, there will be, uh, as you know, a, a whole series of plans that have been in place and meetings and discussions have been taking place uh, about the future of the government of Iraq to be based on work by the Iraqi people from both inside and outside Iraq. Uh, a meeting of free Iraqis will take place very soon. And the timing of the meeting will depend on a number of factors, including the security situation on the ground. But you're sending a political signal if you bring them into Iraq to meet, right? Well, I, I, I don't dispute that. I think that when the meeting takes place, it will be a very powerful signal about the future of Iraq, that there are people from both inside and outside Iraq who care about their country and who will be able uh, leaders of their country, and uh, we don't know all the names of all those people yet. Certainly not everybody who will be at this meeting will represent all of those who will eventually be a part of Iraq. But yeah, as I indicated, we can't, we don't know all the names of all the people yet. Um, the invitations to the meeting will be uh, sent by General Franks. As you know, there have been a carefully laid series of plans made uh, for the reconstruction of Iraq with General Garner on the ground uh, in the region. He reports to General Franks. David? All right, how, uh, how will we know when the regime is really toppled? In other words, I mean, this may seem obvious, but is it a simple matter of geography? Is it a matter of we may not be able to find Saddam Hussein, but we know, you know, people we trust have control of all their weapons? I mean, how, how do we judge that? I think from the president's point of view, um, one, he will be guided very much by the, the military analysis provided to him by General Franks, General Myers, Secretary Rumsfeld. And by that I mean the President will be looking toward uh, what indications do we have of resistance left in the country. And as I indicated, the President this morning cautioned that there are cities uh, in the North that are not like the cities in the South, where uh, there still are pockets of resistance. We don't know how organized that resistance is. It may be organized. And so, one, I think the president will be guided by the military advice he gets about operational facts on the ground dealing with the capability of the Iraqis to resist. Um, that'll be a, a crucial factor. And then I think it'll also be something along the lines of as we start to see Iraqis emerge which we're starting to see in a rolling way in different parts of Iraq as security is, is uh, perceived as being increased, as the threat of Saddam Hussein returning diminishes. We start to see increasing numbers of Iraqis turn out on the ground to start helping in civilian affairs and administrative affairs. So I think it's a combination of those two principally. It, it's clear that this government would like to kill Saddam Hussein, and we've tried on a couple of occasions. Um, if we don't know the, 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 you don't know the, the status of that. If it can be determined by commanders on the ground that he no longer has a command and control function or authority, is he an irrelevancy at that point, even if he's a war criminal in the estimation of this government? No, I, I think that if you put yourself in the place of an Iraqi citizen, uh, they would like to see closure. I think that would be helpful to the people of Iraq. Uh, certainly, we would like to have certain knowledge about Saddam Hussein's fate. In a bigger point of view, though, I think there is a larger point here outside literally is what is Saddam Hussein's fate, which is a relevant matter. But the bigger point is the Iraqi people can already see it and taste it. Their day of freedom has arrived and it is coming. And they make that judgment under their view of whether or not the regime whether it's typified by Saddam Hussein or it's broader in the security forces, have gone and evaporated. That's, I think, how they approach it. David? Is it a measure of success of the campaign that he's either captured or killed? Well, again, I think it, it lends clarity to matters, but it, not, it alone it will not determine the success of the campaign. I think you're starting to see the success of the campaign on the streets of Baghdad. Do you not declare victory until he's captured or killed? I think the president will declare victory when the president thinks it's appropriate time. Helen? The International Red Cross says that the hospitals are 
horrific with uh, filled with casualties. And I wondered whether we're going to bring any of the wounded, especially the children, <coughs> here for hospitalization, uh, medical care. With all respect, that still is an operational issue. Uh, when you talk to DOD, they will tell you they have taken care of many wounded Iraqis, either in facilities of the United States military or. Yes. Terry? Uh, a couple questions. First, the, the mood overall here in the West Wing. There's been a lot of criticism and sniping from this room and elsewhere since the war began of the war plan, of the expectations before the war and what administration officials are saying. Any uh, feeling of vindication or uh, I told you so-ness? <laughs> well, from a personal point of view, I, all I can say is I'm, I'm always glad to be embedded with you. Um, <laughs> No. <laughs> What's wrong with that? No, Terry, I, I think, again, I, my job is to speak for the president. And when I talked to him very early this morning, even before the statue came down, and the president was aware of the scenes of jubilation as people were dancing in the streets of Baghdad, and as the statue came down, um, the president has shared his two points of view. And again, it's, it's the caution on the one hand, but it is, for the president, a real revelation that when he says, and he said this repeatedly leading up to the war, that mankind wants to be free, and that includes the Iraqi people, that that is a doctrine that is not the Bush doctrine, is not an American doctrine, it is a God-given doctrine, <coughs> and that all people everywhere, if given the ability to throw off a repressive government, would want to do so. And the president is heartened by what he's seen on the streets of Baghdad because he knows it means that people are becoming free and that the Iraqi people deserve their place in freedom just like everybody else. On, a, on another issue, uh, the Secretary of Defense said today, we cautioned Syria once again for what he said were uh, indications that they were accepting uh, high-ranking uh, Iraqi officials and perhaps uh, contraband. Uh, we've heard cautions against Iran. In other words, first is, is is Syria next? And if not, what is the message that the president wants the uh, regime change in Baghdad to send to countries like Syria and Iran? Well, I think this is something that Secretary Rumsfeld addressed at his briefing today. And the message is, is rather simple. And that is that um, whether or not the United States is at war or is not at war, Iraq has been under sanctions. And the message to all nations, whether it's Syria or anybody else, is that it is important to obey the sanctions, not to provide military equipment or anything that is banned to the government of Iraq. That is made even worse by the fact that the United States is at war with Iraq for them to engage in that type of behavior. And under any circumstances, it is behavior that is wrong and ought to be stopped. Are, are you, the administration has been saying it was demanding unconditional surrender from Iraq. But at this point, who do you accept surrender from? Is, is it beyond that point of a you know a formal sort of surrender? Well, again, there there still is our military efforts underway. There can be fighting ahead, and so again, I I, I don't want to get drawn too far down that road. Um, I couldn't tell you from a, a legal point of view whom that party must be. Um, I, I think that. So I indicated earlier, the president will be guided by the advice he gets from his military planners about what the military situation is on the ground, whether or not there still are uh, days ahead when there will be fighting or whether or not the country has um, um, been pacified. Are you still seeking a, a surrender, an Iraqi surrender? Well, the president's terms are exactly what he laid out when he went to CENTCOM and spoke about uh, nothing less than total victory. Because total victory means total freedom for the Iraqi people everywhere in Iraq. Not just in some cities, not just in certain religious areas and the Shiite communities, but everywhere in all communities for the Iraqi people. That's what the president is focused on in this mission. That also will enable us to make certain that the regime is fully disarmed everywhere in all their hiding places anywhere. Secondly, uh, Ahmed Chalabi seems to be emerging as the public face of an Iraqi interim leadership. He's you know, he's talking to news outlets and so forth. Is that a role the U.S. is comfortable with? Um, you know, do you see him that way as, as a... Well, I think there's going to be any number of people who emerge as uh, playing different leadership roles. And I'm not prepared to start naming names of one or another. Um, there'll be um, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of names of Iraqis who emerge in all regions of the country to take leadership into their own hands. And that's a good, th a good sign. 
uh, designated or no, there, there'll be, likely in your, in your he is he is one name of many people <laughs> who yearn for a free Iraq and are prepared to help make it happen. Elizabeth? We are going to expect, we should expect a statement or a speech from the president declaring that the war is won. Is no, that what you're I, I was asked about a speech by the president. I said I can't speculate about whether there'd be a speech by the president or not. It's not a yes or a no. It's a maybe. Just the president's reminder is that we're still in the middle of a war, and I think it's premature to get into that. Meeting in Nasiriya um, delayed. Was there a trouble? Was it because of security considerations? The meeting of the uh, Iraqi exiles and the Iraqis. Well, I'm not aware that it was delayed. There would be a meeting sometime after the 12th. The president said it was going to be the 12th. And yeah, I, I think as his staff, his staff worked with reporters about that afterwards. How are those, the exiles going to get to that meeting? Is the government going to provide transportation? That's an operational question still. You'd have to talk to the people on the ground there. But I think it's fair to say that when people are prepared to go far for freedom, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see how many people from both inside Iraq and outside Iraq want to play a role in helping Iraq become a democratic country, a free country, and a country that does not use torture or tyranny to treat its people. And however they get there, the world should rejoice by the fact they're going. Fly them over? I, I don't know. I don't do travel arrangements. Uh, DOD will. Yeah, I just I don't know the answer. So it's still, it's, there's still going to be a series of questions that are operational even regarding the reconstruction effort. Um, keep in mind that Gen retired General Garner reports to General Franks, and there still is a chain of command as far as the reconstruction goes. And this is part of the military mission, built into the military mission, was prudent planning for what could lie ahead involving the reconstruction and the freedom of Iraq. That is still part of the military chain of command. At what point can the people of Iraq expect the formation of an interim authority? I still think it's too soon to say. Uh, I think that as a result of the strong progress that's being made, their hopes are, are going to be realized. And I think they're going to be realized uh, sooner rather than later. But I can't be more specific. Right, who is in charge of Iraq today? Um, Iraq is a country that still is in the middle of a war. And we don't know if Saddam Hussein is alive or not. But I think it's increasingly fair to say it's not a question of who is in charge of Iraq but what is in charge of Iraq. And what is in charge of Iraq is the taste of freedom. And that's what's driving the Iraqi people. All right, if I may ask you a related question, at what point will the regime of Saddam Hussein be disarmed? That is, what do you mean by disarmed in the sense that you've been using it in this room for seven months? Well, the president always made clear that disarmament applied to weapons of mass destruction, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and any infrastructure for the development of nuclear weapons. That's what the president has always report, refer, referred to as disarmament. That's his focus, and that's what he refers to. Chris? Ari, you said earlier today that uh, today's a historic day. Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld mentioned earlier today he evoked the Berlin Wall. Is this? Does the White House see this as the geopolitical earthquake, the, the uh, tantamount to the Berlin Wall falling in the Middle East? Well, again, uh, the president continues to urge caution, and so I'm not going to go beyond what I, what I have said. Uh, I think historians will make judgments about what today means, but today certainly marks uh, a wonderful day for the Iraqi people as they pursue the freedom to which they are entitled. I have a question, too, about the northern Iraq is going to be increasingly the focus of any further fighting. And how much, how much... You uh, cannot forget, this. what you're watching in Baghdad is that which the camera lens can show you in Baghdad. Baghdad is a large, large city in terms of people and size. There are other areas of Baghdad that are dangerous areas of Baghdad where fighting can still take place. So just urge caution on you, and still, certainly in parts of the south, efforts are still underway, although no question. Thank goodness, tremendous progress is made. But I still think it would be reasonable to say that the, that will be increasingly the focus is in the north. What's going to happen in the north is still fighting there. How much concern is there that if the Kurds take control of the oil fields, that that could invite the Turkey to perhaps move into northern Iraq? They have threatened to do so. Mm -hmm. And what contacts are there with Turkey right now? Well, again, the, for well, I think almost a month now, I've been asked questions about has Turkey crossed the border? Has Turkey crossed the border? And every day the answer remains no. And this is as a result of some very good diplomacy that's been conducted between the United States and Turkey. And because of Turkey's desire to make certain that there was not a humanitarian crisis in the north, 
they had talked about the need to potentially go into a small area of the border, and no humanitarian crisis has resulted in the north. And so therefore, that predicate does not come into play. Um, we continue to work very collaboratively with the Kurds, and they understand our message. And the message is that the territorial integrity of Iraq must be preserved, and we mean that. Mark? Right. Following up on Elizabeth's question, um, there's a very clear perception around the world that the administration has given a leg up to Mr. Chalabi and the Iraqi National <coughs> Congress. Um, the administration flew in members of the INC into Iraq over the weekend. Uh, in advance of the meeting, does the administration plan to fly in other Iraqi exiles? And if not, then how do you answer that perception that we are, in fact, giving him a leg up over the others? Okay. Well, again, it's a DOD matter about who is flown in or who is not, and I don't speak for that. My, but my point was that the world should rejoice that people want to leave wherever they are to go back into Iraq and to welcome all of those who are participating in helping Iraq find freedom. And as I indicated, he is one among many people who are going to be playing a role in helping Iraq become free. He's the only one that you've airlifted in so far. So I don't know that. I, I don't know that this is the case. This is a DOD matter, and I think it's an easy question for you to ask DOD. I just don't know that that's the case, that's, that's an accurate statement or not. So the war, you're not ready to say the war is over yet. Is it fair to say that there is a complete collapse of central authority in Iraq? I think those are uh, operational matters, and I think the operational people will talk about that. <laughs> that's an operational matter? Sure. To what extent uh, does the administration figure out uh, what it will take in terms of legal authority for Iraqis to begin to sell oil, which of course would make it easier for them to begin their own reconstruction and, and to get services back up? Well, the lawyers will, will talk about these type of matters, uh, but what's important from the President's point of view is that the Iraqi people uh, are put in a position as quickly as they can. They take their own position as quickly as they can to be in charge of their own resources, their own ways, and their own means. And uh, I think we will increasingly see that start to happen. And that would include uh, Iraq's resources, such as oil. Now, there are still UN sanctions against the sale of oil, except under oil for food. Correct. Uh, does the administration intend to go back to the UN either to get those sanctions lifted? or any number of other issues, including who might be the representative of Iraq at the United Nations, what plans do you have for going Well, one, as a result of the actions that the President thanked the Secretary General and the United Nations Security Council for in their passage of the reauthorization of the oil food program as amended, uh, many of these issues have been taken care of for an interim period of time so that uh, the oil can begin to flow from Iraq as soon as they are able. But the president looks forward to the day when sanctions are removed on the Iraqi people. The only reason the United Nations imposed sanctions on Iraq were because Iraq failed to comply with Security Council resolutions, and therefore the Iraqi regime invited the sanctions on itself. The Iraqi people were not deserving of sanctions. The Iraqi regime had the sanctions imposed. So the president looks forward to the day when those sanctions can indeed be removed in Iraq and trade just like any other nation on Earth. Is there a sense that there's a need to go back to the UN, and if so, what is the first task that the U.S. would take up with the United Nations regarding Iraq? Well, the United Nations has already been involved in, in Iraq. As you know, Kofi Annan announced a special representative uh, to Iraq, um, and his name is Mr. Ahmed, and he has significant experience and expertise that we believe will prove invaluable in assisting in the humanitarian needs and the reconstruction needs of Iraq. So the United Nations has quite a bit of expertise in this area. We're pleased with the appointment of a special United Nations representative, and they will indeed play a vital role. But you have no plans at the moment to go back to the Security Council anytime in the near future for any sort of authorization or endorsement of any particular group. I'm trying to figure out what the next step is. No, the if you Nations. go back to the statement that the President and Prime Minister Blair issued in the Azores, it talks about the endorsement of uh, interim authority. Um, the President talked about the um, role of the United Nations in helping to, uh, to discuss the, mem the membership on the IIA, and as well as, of course, any time if there's a discussion of sanctions being removed, the United Nations Security Council has to be the entity to do it. Um, or yesterday, when the president was asked about the vital, to describe the vital role that he envisioned for the UN in a post-war uh, Iraq, um, he mentioned uh, food and medicine and the delivery of humanitarian relief. 
But he also uh, talked about uh, the UN helping to stand up. Uh, what was the phrase that I think he used? The interim authority. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you know how that uh, would work beyond the, the, the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Well, I think what the president says specifically on that is suggest names for the interim authority, and we welcome that participation by the United Nations. Wait a minute, so it's just names? That's it? You just suggest some people and then th th that's, well, that's, that's the extent to which they help out the interim authority? Number one, this role is significant when you talk about humanitarian relief, when you talk about aiding and reconstruction, when you talk about suggestion of names. This is significant. But I want to remind you, as Kofi Annan has said, the United Nations does not want to own Iraq. The United Nations, according to Secretary General Annan, does not want to administer Iraq. That is not the role the United Nations seeks for itself. The President, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, believe that the Iraqi people are very capable people, a well-educated people, that the infrastructure of Iraq was a strong infrastructure below the level of the Ba'ath Party regime. As a result of the military operation, much of that infrastructure remains in place. So the focus is on the Iraqi people and what they can do for themselves with assistance from the United States, the United Kingdom, and the United Nations. Jacobo? In the Middle East, symbolism plays a major role. He said the president watched part of today on half of the statue when the Marine put the American flag over the head of Saddam Hussein briefly. And what did the president feel as commander-in-chief? Did he feel this is something that could have caused uh, problems in the region? Well, I, th I think that when you talk about the message that people are going to remember from today, even uh, in, in all regions of the world, the message they're going to remember today is the Iraqi people toppling the statue. The United States was there to help, of course. The Iraqi people, the toppling of the statue, and the Iraqi people dragging the statue through the streets, and a message that is unmistakable in the Arab world, the Iraqi people throwing shoes and attacking the statue with their shoes. That speaks volumes. And the second question, Harry, getting away a little bit from the Iraq side, the president meets tomorrow with the five presidents of Central America. You have initiated negotiations for a free trade agreement with the region, which you expect to finish this year. From the program I've seen, the president is going to meet with all his staff, vice president, secretary of state, secretary of treasurer, Condoleezza Rice. What importance has the president attached to this free trade agreement? Is this part of the overall trade agreement with Latin America? Well, the president looks forward to tomorrow's meeting with the uh, representatives, the presidents of the Central American nations for many reasons. Um, trade is a <coughs> crucial part of our United States' relationship with those countries. And the president's Wrapping up the daily press trade briefing trade and our coverage of a new day in Iraq begins right now. It's noon on the West Coast, 3 o'clock on the East Coast, 11 p.m. in Baghdad, and you are looking live where today they're tasting freedom. An amazing morning in what used to be Saddam's Baghdad. Just hours ago, this was the scene. Jubilation, celebration, and excitement as coalition forces rumbled into the capital city. American tanks rolling into the square, bringing with them old glory. The Iraqi people taking aim at one of the main symbols of the dictator, a massive 40-foot statue erected just a year ago, throwing stones and shoes, tying a noose around his neck, and bringing Saddam Hussein in, in symbol to the ground with some help from coalition forces using a marine armored vehicle to leave him right there. Despite all the celebrations on the street, the Pentagon warns this war is not over. Even still, coalition troops and Iraqis alike couldn't help cheering the destruction of this symbol of a dictatorship. Is this it? Yeah, this is just about it. You've got nothing else to really let's, take. Well, let's hope so. All the people here is happy. I see. And good afternoon from Fox News World Headquarters in New York City. I'm Shepard Smith. It's good to have you with us for continuing coverage of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Through it all, we've been listening to our correspondents embedded there to our first correspondent to arrive inside Baghdad. That was our own Greg Kelly, 
who rumbled into the palace and took it for the coalition to return it to the people of Iraq. And even before that, our correspondent through our sister network, Sky News, David Shader, had sat and listened and talked and attempted to communicate with Iraqi minders at him at every moment. The minders left this morning. When the tanks rolled into town, he knows not where they went, but he had quite a story to tell from the streets of Baghdad today. The U.S. Marine Corps, very good to see them. We can now wander around these streets asking people what we want because these guys have fought their way here. This is what freedom means. What freedom means and celebrated throughout the center of the capital city. There are battles to be fought. We listened live just an hour ago as one street fight was underway, as our own Marines were taking fire. But there's now a widespread belief that that is soon to be a thing of the past as old glory is eventually removed and the Iraqi flag from many decades ago is returned to the people of that nation. Let's go now to Simon Marks, our correspondent who spent a great deal of time in Baghdad himself. Quite a different place this evening. Yes, Simon? Absolutely amazing, Shep. I tell you, about three weeks ago in Baghdad, I was talking to a 25-year-old Ministry of Information official, a young man in the pay of Saddam's regime, and he quietly took me to one side and said, you know, in this country, fear is our food. Well, today in Baghdad, many of the city's residents are starting to dine at the table of freedom. It will still be a while before they can enjoy a full meal there. We'll talk about some of the military challenges that still lie ahead in a minute, but let's reprise the day. It started with U.S. tanks moving in on the city from three separate positions, encircling Baghdad after a quiet night in the city and finding as they drove into the center of town very little resistance on the way in. That perhaps the first indication of the momentous events that were to follow as Iraqis, some giving themselves up, others starting to welcome U.S. forces, then turned against the symbols of Saddam Hussein's regime. Pictures were torn up. They were burnt. They were torn down and then as uh, U.S. forces closed in on the center of the city we watched absolutely astonishing scenes as tanks took up position in Firdosh Square right in the center of Baghdad the square dominated by that enormous statue of Saddam Hussein. It took both people power and military power to bring that statue down. Bringing statues down, as we've seen in Eastern Europe in the past, can be a lengthy process, but this was the tipping point, the point at which the British government said Saddam Hussein's rule over Iraq disintegrated and the government back in Washington couldn't agree more. People in the square started to celebrate as the statue came down, uh, the Iraqi flag flying proudly in the square, and then shortly thereafter, the head of the statue being dragged around the square and people hitting it with their shoes. That's a deep symbol in this part of the world, the soles of shoes. You can't, you can't offer anybody a bigger insult than showing them that. And then after that, the celebrations began. The kinds of scenes that military and political planners in both Washington, D.C., London, and many other capitals had longed to see. Iraq is finally sensing that they were free, sensing that the regime of Saddam Hussein was at an end, had the ability to take to the streets and express their opinions freely for the first time. And in scenes that have been repeated again and again all over the world, and especially here in the Arab world, on those pan-Arab television stations. Iraqis have been seen celebrating the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime, welcoming the arrival of American troops, welcoming the end of an era of repressive government that has left the Iraqi people stripped of their human rights, stripped of their freedom of speech, and ready now to start the process of building a new Iraq. In some parts of the city, the picture was not entirely uh, as positive. There had been looting reported earlier in the day in some government offices, people literally running out with anything they could get their hands on. In Saddam City, a predominantly Shiite area of the city, home to around two million Shiite Muslims, loud celebrations on the streets. The Shiites had been brutally repressed by Saddam Hussein. That tank driving through the center of the square, carrying the stars and stripes, the most visible symbol that we had yet seen, that the United States had come to the center of Baghdad and had completed at least a very significant part of its military mission. 
The military mission continues, though. There is still fighting in some parts of Baghdad itself. Pockets of resistance, unstructured operations by Iraqis who remain loyal to Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein's whereabouts, the whereabouts of his entire government. A mystery, and at this point, Shep, it perhaps doesn't really matter. Simon Marks, alive for us. Simon, thank you very much. As that statue of Saddam was ripped from its pedestal, it marked the symbolic end of his totalitarian regime in Iraq. We now know that the Arab networks and state-controlled uh, television networks across the Arab world carry those pictures and the celebrations around it live. And for our Secretary of Defense, it marks the time when Saddam Hussein takes his place with others who've left scars on the face of mankind. Saddam Hussein is now taking his rightful place alongside Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, Kochetsku in the pantheon of failed, brutal dictators. And the Iraqi people are well on their way to freedom. From the government. Uh, this was only on Fox and continues to be, and I'd like to listen to that soundbite again. Listen closely with us. Sir, a statement. Are you prepared well, to... There's no statement. The game is over. We hope the peace will prevail, and that's all what we hope. Are you prepared to surrender? Are you prepared to announce What's that Saddam Hussein What's and your regime game, has sir? surrendered? Have you surrendered, That's sir? all what I have to say What's to tell game? you. Have you surrendered? The game is over. We hope the peace will prevail. Sounds like news to me. Let's go to the senior White House correspondent, Jim Angle, live on the North Lawn. Jim, astounding that he would talk and surprising that he would say that. Well, the uh, game is over. Uh, one would hope means that the Iraqis have finally recognized that the jig is up here. I mean, this is something, Shep. I listened to the Iraqi information minister a couple of days ago uh, as we were just before we left for Belfast. As he tried to explain the American takeover of the airport in Iraq, in Baghdad and de flatly denied that it had been taken over, said that Iraqis had repelled American troops, they had intentionally left open one little corner of the airport and that the U.S. would come running in every time they stopped bombing and take pictures for propaganda purposes. I mean, it was so far from reality that one wondered if the Iraqi officials actually believed it or were simply trying to keep up appearances that they were in fact resisting. This would be the first suggestion that Iraqi officials are beginning to see reality and of course it may be easier for someone in the United States watching the statue of his leader being torn down by the Iraqi people may be easier for him to actually absorb the reality than it is for those in Iraq who are worried about what will happen to them over the next 24 to 48 hours. You know, Shep. Jim, saying all of that and, and knowing what we now know and I guess have known but now are sure of about how this regime works. I, I quite frankly wonder if this minister of information didn't have to say things just as our own David Shader admitted he had to say things. I would think for Mohammed al duri there were two choices, say that or eventually say nothing. Well, he is, he is certainly here and could stay here, obviously, if he wanted to. No, I was uh, talking so about Mohammed al duri uh, I, I, was, I was talking about Baghdad Bob. I mean, he, it seems to me oh, he well, had okay, to yeah. say that. Oh, yeah, he has very little choice. I mean, he has to come out and say it, although the ridiculousness of what he was saying sometimes <laughs> was so far out there that you wondered how he could do it with a straight face. But the fact is, yeah, he had to say those things, though uh, it'll be interesting to see if there is any further statement from the Iraqi government in Baghdad. The vice president is saying the day that we're witnessing the collapse of all central authority in Iraq, uh, meaning that the center uh, has collapsed and deteriorated. Now, obviously, the White House is very keen on pointing out that this is a very dangerous time. The White House refused to say today that the war is over, noting that there are still people, they're still fighting in parts of Iraq, and there is still a great deal of danger because you have a lot of people attached to the regime who are likely to strike out in desperation here at the end. So no one here is gloating, no one is celebrating victory over Iraq. What they are celebrating What's are the sights that you've been showing all day, Shep, of Iraqi people finally getting a taste of freedom. Shep. All right, Jim Angle live at the White House. I expect we'll hear from the president in due time at a point of the commander in chief's choosing. Coming up live from Studio B, we're live at the Pentagon and CENTCOM's forward headquarters in Qatar, where military planners ordered U.S. tanks to roll into Baghdad this morning. And for the soldiers who fought their way into the Iraqi capital, a just reward. 
What's it been like fighting your way into Baghdad and seeing Baghdad after knowing about it for so long? Uh, it's, it's satisfying to see that these people ain't got to suffer anymore. It's been a lot of suffering down south due to his suppression, and uh, we're glad that it's going to be over for the people now that they can actually start to move on and uh, have a, a normal life without Saddam. down Saddam. Hello everyone, I'm Kieran Chetri. Destroying symbols of Iraqi oppression in the heart of Baghdad, U.S. Marines using an armored vehicle pulled down this giant statue of Saddam Hussein. Once it hit the ground, crowds of Iraqis jumped on the statue, cheering and waving Iraqi flags. Earlier, Marines in tanks and armored personnel carriers rolled into the um, We can only say this, it's not what he's wearing experience so these people who know what they were doing and they say the more level-headed they are here particularly on a day like today the safer the troops will be out in the field so the bottom line from central command tonight is this is just one more step lester in this overall fight i, I want to back up though what, what you're saying regarding the threat in the north cities like tikrit because of the lack of press freedom, we haven't had the cameras to show the bombing and what's been going on there. Is CENTCOM giving you a sense of how much they may have degraded Iraqi forces in those places? Well, and just uh, listening to General Brooks talk about that today in the press briefing, what happened there was uh, many of the Republican Guard divisions who were up there protecting to Crete for a coalition advance on that city actually came south when they saw the coalition moving up from the south. So many of them uh, came south and elements of them were destroyed by the coalition. From what we understand, there has been some repositioning. So some of those uh, elements have moved back up towards Tikrit. And we learned uh, today from listening to General Myers at the Pentagon that there's still more than 10 regular army divisions in northern Iraq, as well as one brigade of the Republican Guard. So there are Iraqi forces in the north. Uh, how much they are degraded, uh, they're not telling us right now. I'm sure they have a better idea. They're able to look from their predators, and, and of course, they have the special operations units on the ground. So that is a, a fight that will happen on another day, perhaps in the near future. All right, Rob Morrison, thank you for the update from CENTCOM in Doha. The arrival of American troops, you've seen the pictures today, amazing. It brought a lot of Iraqis to their feet as they took to the center of the city to celebrate. Neil Connery from our British partner ITN picks up the story. To venture out was a calculated risk, but an irresistible one. We'd heard no gunfire, and there were enough Iraqi cars on the road to give us confidence. One of the first places we reached was an office used by Saddam Hussein's secret police. Here, his numerous portraits were going up in flames. At last, ordinary Iraqis were showing their true feelings towards their leader. When people saw our camera, they couldn't hide their delight at the turn of events. Further on, we spoke to some civilians who told me how they felt. Saddam going? Yes. Saddam going? Saddam! I am happy, I am happy. Yeah, fight. Feeling fight. Fight them, fight them. Then, all of a sudden, the United States Marines showed up. on the streets of the Iraqi capital. Hello, we're from British television. The Americans gestured for us to come and meet them. How are you doing? My name's John Alvine. Sergeant Governor, how are you doing? From ITN. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Sergeant, you yes, say? Yes, sir. Welcome to Baghdad. Oh, thank you. How does it feel to be here? Oh, it feels pretty good. I mean, it's nice to you know, represent the Marine Corps here. And uh, Gulf 223 out of Los Alamitos, California. Nice. Well, when did you guys get in? Uh, we've been uh, here exactly. Yeah. We've been here. Uh, we just got here about a week ago. Right. And okay. uh, when, did you, when did you get into Baghdad? Baghdad, just just now. Well, actually, last night. And what sort of welcome have you had from ordinary people here? I'm very lucky, man. Oh, how are you doing? Uh, nice to meet you, sir. You? We, we wait you a long time. Oh, yes. You know that? We've been, we've been waiting to come here a long time, sir. But we need to uh, finish uh, very uh, quick. Yes, sir. Not like in 1991. Right. Hamid is our Iraqi driver. Thank you. They are the, uh, the cashier of weapons with a civilian truck. 
Yeah. They had all the uh, RPGs, AK-47s on this uh, civilian truck here. Right, okay. The Marines were destroying Iraqi weaponry they'd found in the back of a lorry. The soldiers appeared relaxed, some were clearly exhausted, but others were keen to talk about their experiences. What sort of response have you had from, from ordinary civilians you've come across? Actually, the civilians have been very uh, cooperative. They're uh, pretty cheerful that we're here, and uh, we haven't had any conflict with them whatsoever. One of the men was a veteran of the first Gulf War. The uh, first Gulf War is pretty much we had a clear clear objective. We had to push all the uh, Iraqis out of Kuwait, push them up back towards Iraq. Um, everything was pretty much wide in the open, um, just keep heading south, and everything we saw was enemy. This time as we go through, we have a civilian population to worry about, and um, it's kind of hard for us because we have to judge between the civilian and military, and uh, it's easy for us to win the war by completely destroying everything in front of us, but that's not what we want to do. Several Marines were guarding the hotel that had been the base for the UN weapons inspectors in Baghdad. Looters had been here and the Americans rescued UN cars before they were driven away. At one point, the soldiers thought they were coming under fire. Behind the white truck! Sniper's got eyes on, sir. They're looking right now. The snipers with eyes on were two marine sharpshooters on the hotel roof, but they weren't needed. Eventually, the marine commander decided that the Iraqi gunfire was probably more celebratory than aggressive. These men are part of a company of 200 American marines who fought their way into Baghdad last night. They are pleased with their accomplishments so far and remain confident. They don't believe this war is over yet, but they do believe it's nearing an end. And indeed, that came very quickly. Just a few hours later, the US cavalry rolled straight into the city center unopposed. What a formidable force this was. The Americans might not yet control Baghdad in its entirety, but they do hold all the important parts. A war of three weeks has brought an end to decades of Iraqi misery. John Irvine, ITV News, in liberated Baghdad. Well, you might have whiplash for how things have moved quickly today. And looking at that scene of celebration, at the same time, we keep hearing caution that there's a lot more work to be done. I've got a couple gentlemen here who will explain what kind of work has to be done. Colonel Jack Jacobs, uh, Colonel Michael Brown, both MSNBC military analysts and retired U.S. Army. We keep hearing that Tikrit, uh, Kirkuk, two cities with a lot of Iraqi soldiers, and they right now have control. How does the U.S. deal with that? We know, we know they've been bombing there. How, do, how does the U.S. wrestle control those two cities? Well, other than continuing to bomb, we need to move forces on the ground in order to take those cities. And the way to do that is the way we've done it before. Lots of indirect and air support move in with very heavy forces. Well, we heard, we heard some reports that they might have been dropping some tanks in there, airlifting some tanks in the north, but not a lot. How do you get the heavy firepower up there on the ground? Well, the 4th Infantry Division has one brigade already kitted out down in Kuwait. They're way down here in All Kuwait. All the way down there. Are how they going to drive straight up, or how are they going to get up well, here? Well, that's one way to do it, but an easier way is to put them on tank transporters, drive that up through the secure areas in the western desert, bring it up there, and then air land the troops right on their... What do you mean? Put it on a trailer, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Seriously. Yeah. And that's you know, a day and a half, two days, maybe. Well, maybe Probably less than that. Less than that, I think. Right. If they, they really go, really move fast, the area is secure. Right? For Desert Shield, uh, Third Armored Division, First Armored Divisions, once the tanks came into the ports, marry up the crew with the tanks, load them onto those trucks, and you just haul them up the highway. Now we haven't heard a lot about these supply lines. Are we assuming that everything is clear here now? That you can make a leisurely drive up north? Exactly, and 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 that's why the forces in place have to continue to be in place to maintain the supply lines, uh, and also build up the supply lines up up north because a heavy uh, division is going to suck a lot of fuel and it's going to require a lot of fuel capability up north. How quick, how quick could these cities fall, given the pounding they've apparently been receiving? Again, we don't have the pictures, those vivid, vivid pictures we saw in Baghdad, but presumably they're putting a lot of ordnance on targets. Well, there. the good news for Tikrit is that it's small. Bad news is, is that it's uh, loyal to Saddam Hussein, it's his hometown. Mosul is a different story, it's much larger, but the bad news is we command the terrain around it we have we, uh, the high ground around it, and we, it has been taking a real pounding. Kirkuk is probably not going to be that difficult, but we do need to get forces up there. By the way, there's one thing we haven't mentioned, and that is uh, Baghdad International Airport. 
Uh, with that secure, we can forward stage man material vehicles of all types and varieties to do the kind of in in transport refueling that exactly. uh, Colonel Brown's talking about. Well, let, let's, let's talk about the other issue: the, the troops who would be here in Tikrit. Uh, these are loyal troops. That's Saddam's hometown. Their back is against the wall. No doubt they've seen the pictures of what was happening in Baghdad. They've seen the pictures of celebrating Kurds. How dangerous are those troops right now, Jack? Well, I, I think they could possibly be very dangerous, especially if, you know, we've, we've almost written off the whole issue of chemical weapons. But Mike and I were talking earlier. Obviously, in Baghdad, it's too close and, and, and all the rest of that stuff. But that's his hometown. And there may be some crazy people up there who may have the authority to release chemical weapons, that is a danger to us and we have to be on guard for that. And Mikey, chemical weapons have been your expertise in the Army. Is, is that the likely place? We've, we've heard so much about Baghdad. It's the capital. The assumption is all the goodies would be there. Right. But Saddam Hussein, we know, has liked to surround himself with those he can trust and keep a very tight inner circle. So what, do we, what should we know about Tick Crit as we watch that battle? Exactly. I think it's a possibility, but again, I think it's going to be a key. Does he have the shooters? Does he have the weapon systems? to deliver. Otherwise, you can see very, very crude five-gallon cans of agent, uh, which would really be a pyrrhic victory of, of sorts for him because well, he's not going to gain anything. Could that be what prevented the use of them down here, the fact that the delivery systems were taken out? All those flashes we walked every night here, we didn't know it was blowing up. Could those have been the artillery units and the things that would have fired this stuff? Exactly. That, 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 that's what I am thinking. Artillery, missiles, rockets, all those delivery systems that could target U.S. forces, coalition forces, I think were destroyed. Colonel Jacobs, Colonel Brown, gentlemen, we're going to keep you around. we got a lot more questions, but right now what we want to do is go through the uh, very latest. If you're just tuning in, here are the uh, headlines. It's nighttime in Baghdad, nearly midnight there. Jubilant celebrations earlier in the streets. During the day, the U.S. Marine tanks rolled into the center of the city. The White House and Pentagon cautioning the war isn't over yet, saying there is still fighting ahead. The situation in the city is a mix of chaos, celebration, and don't forget, still pockets of resistance. One of the many symbolic images of Saddam Hussein's regime comes tumbling down, Iraq, Iraqis cheering as that statue of Saddam Hussein was pulled down. President Bush was watching the scene as it happened. He said, quote, they got it down. He then continued to watch the images for a few moments with interest, according to his press secretary. There was also celebrations in northern Iraq today. U.S. forces allied with local Kurdish fighters took a strategic mountain just east of the town of Mosul. It was seen as a significant victory in the north, but still caution that there are major cities in the north. We've just been talking about them. They are not under coalition control yet. So no one jumping for joy in the halls of U.S. Uh, government buildings in Washington. Apparently, plans are already being made for a meeting of liberated Iraqis and Iraqis from outside the country. The meetings are intended to be a forum for Iraqis to discuss their vision of the future of Iraq and their ideas regarding the Iraqi interim authority. No word yet on exactly when or where this will be in taking place. This is Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. He has paid a no, visit to Capitol Hill and he's taking a few questions. Steps of intelligence indicating that people are flowing into that country across the border and uh, family some, members. some family members possibly and some are staying there and some are uh, transiting uh, and going to other countries. Mr. Secretary, can you respond to the Iraqi ambassador just said course or duration of the war? You're going to have to speak up. How do you think confirmation of Saddam's death would affect the course or duration of the war? Well, I guess time will tell. The Iraqi ambassador just said in an interview that the game is now over and that he hopes peace will prevail. Can you react to that? Who is this? This is the Iraqi ambassador, Al Jory. To what? He said he just. The said Iraqi amb ambassador to what? To the U.S. To the U.S. He said the game is now over. Well, I would say it wasn't a game uh, first, and, and uh, I would also say it's, it, it was over when President Bush announced that uh, that that the uh, Saddam Hussein regime had refused to accept their last opportunity to cooperate with the UN resolutions and it was only a matter of time after that now we had a good day today however uh, it is not over there's going to be a lot of difficult work left dangerous work and and there will be uh, additional fights would let there be no doubt about it and uh, while it's wonderful to see the faces of the Iraqi people being liberated and, and to feel the joy they have to feel to be free of that vicious regime, nonetheless, the task that the terrific young men and women on the ground there are performing 
isn't over, and they're going to they're going to continue to be in danger and, until the the uh, uh, the entire mission is completed, which it is not. And we have to we. I'm sorry not. Uh, we've got to go to the house and speak to those folks. Thank you. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld uh, in an upbeat mood as he assesses uh, what we've been seeing in Baghdad today. He's uh, visiting members of the House of Representatives. We've seen Iraqis waving the American flags in celebration of the fall of Baghdad, mindful that it is a rather small picture, but the picture is a bit different. Uh, here's a man in northern Iraq decided to add a little bit of Americana to the red, white, and blue. His versions of Old Glory come complete with a Harley Davidson for all the world to see. Ian Glover James from our British partner ITN has more on how Iraqis are reacting to the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime. As American tanks rolled unopposed into central Baghdad, Iraqi people rolled out to meet them, greeting them as liberators. For years, Saddam's image had looked down on these people like Big Brother. Now it was time for them to take their revenge. Across the capital today, there have been scenes of celebration at the fall of the regime. Washington and London may be expressing caution about the fact that it's not all over. But these people were in no doubt. For them, Saddam's era is over. Across Baghdad, the looting has continued since word swept across communities that Saddam's henchmen had pulled out. It may be anarchy, it may be lawlessness, but it's also the first real freedom these people have tasted in decades. This is the predominantly Shiite Muslim area of Baghdad, named Saddam City. It won't be called that for much longer. And if anyone had any lingering doubts about whether these people supported the military intervention, many in halting English made their views clear. For some, it's still perhaps a sight hard to get used to. U.S. troops on patrol in the capital. There had been concern about whether it would be safe for them to leave their armored vehicles, and indeed they are exercising extreme caution. Tom, first, the, uh, the forces that are in Baghdad still have combat work to do. Uh, that is not complete at, any, at, at this point. We certainly have seen areas where the population knows that the regime is gone and will never return again in the way that it has been in the past. There are still pockets. We haven't located every leader of the regime. We haven't found every instrument of the regime, and so those operations continue. What I would describe to you is, throughout the country, wherever we can begin to establish the conditions for life going on, that occurs as soon as we can. This man vented his frustration and fury by striking Saddam's image with his shoe, a traditional insult. Another man expressed his views more graphically. Slapping Saddam with a shoe was a popular activity today. Across Baghdad, the looters are reported to have plundered major sites, including the UN headquarters and the bombed Olympic Committee building, once run by Saddam's eldest son, Uday. People are seizing whatever they can, from foodstuffs to mattresses, anything of value. Many of the more frenzied scenes were said to be in Saddam city, impoverished, run down, deliberately kept under the thumb of the Iraqi regime. Not anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Bush. We very like Mr. Bush. Mr. Bush. Okay. The Americans will have to restore order and soon. But for the time, Baghdad belongs to the people. No longer Saddam Hussein and his Ba'ath Party dictatorship. Ian Glover James, ITV News, Baghdad. And after an historic day, let's recognize the troops for all that they continue to do and the sacrifices in this operation. MSNBC's Natalie Morales joins us now at our America's Bravest Wall with tribute to those men and women on the front lines and behind the scenes. Natalie? Lester, thanks. And you can imagine the pride at home today seeing those pictures of the Iraqi regime beginning to fall and the celebration on the streets of Baghdad as well and other parts and knowing that much of it is perhaps thanks to their loved ones. So let's share some of the names and faces of those who are a big part of Operation Iraqi freedom. This right here is E4 specialist Michael Watson. Let's see, I'm going to put him up over here. 
And uh, he is in the Army Reserves, deployed initially to Kuwait. The photo sent to us by his parents, Terry and Rick Mitchell. They write they want everyone to know how much they love him and how proud they are of him and all the others who are fighting for our freedom. Well, this right here is Corporal David Frizzell. He is uh, in the Marines, a mortar specialist. And uh, on his third deployment to the Persian Gulf, his parents, Cynthia and Kenneth Frizzell, write that in one of his last emails, he wrote, I feel proud to be doing what I'm doing, and I truly believe it is the right thing to do. And finally, a proud wife sends us this photo of her husband, Sergeant Thomas Mostella, who has served uh, eight years, a little crooked there, served eight years in the Army. He's with the 3rd Infantry Division, perhaps right now in the heart of Baghdad. And Carlos Mostella writes that she would like to thank her husband for his strong will and effort. Quote, we are all grateful for the support that he and his fellow troops are providing for us. Well, do you have loved ones who are serving overseas? If so, we'd like to feature them on our America's Bravest photo wall. You can mail the picture to America's Bravest, P.O. Box 2617, Secaucus, New Jersey, 07096. You can also find that address on our website. And along with our America's Bravest tribute, be sure to check out our Bravest, our website. Go to bravest.msnbc.com. You'll find a link that will let you email those pictures of your loved ones as well. And you also want to read the Army fam Family Journal, some touching messages that have been sent to us by everyone from soldiers to spouses. Again, the address is bravest.msnbc.com. Lester, back over to you. Natalie, thanks. And before we close out this hour of, uh, of our continuing coverage, I want to bring Pat Buchanan and Bill Press back into the conversation. I want to ask you, and, and uh, Bill, let me begin with you. Sure. Will this apparent success change any minds? Those who were against this war thought it was wrong. Do you think that it will change any views either here or abroad? I don't think anyone can not be moved by seeing the Iraqis celebrating today. It's a day of celebration. It's a day of liberation. It's a day the Iraqi people have waited for a long time. Everybody's got to rejoice in that, Lester. Now I think the key question is, will the United States be seen as an army of liberation or an army of occupation? That tough job begins tomorrow. What do you think, Pat? Uh, I think, Lester, that the United States has won the military victory. It is extraordinary. A lot of people who might have been against the war will say it was a good war. But the key thing here now is the political victory. And that's why the Americans ought to show those torture chambers. They ought to bring out those victims. They ought to show them day in and day out to make the moral case that this was a moral and just war. And the second thing they need to do, I think they've got to run down and find some of those weapons of mass destruction to show that the president was not kidding. He was telling the truth. Bill, you had, you had a point you wanted to make? Well, I was just going to say on the weapons of mass destruction, I think Pat is right. I think they're there. I think we will find them. Uh, I hope we find them, because if we don't find them, then a lot of people around the world are still going to continue to question what this war was all about. But it is, a, it is a day of victory, Lester. All right. Total day of victory. Bill Press, Pat Buchanan, gentlemen, thank you for your thoughts. There is a lot more coverage ahead. It is nighttime in Baghdad. There have been shots, occasional explosions, and a new day will bring who knows what, but it does appear that Saddam Hussein's grip on power is over. Now, we realize some of the NBC stations have been leaving our coverage, others joining us, but a reminder, we're on cable 24-7 with continuing coverage of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Natalie Morales picks up our coverage next.